Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the WTF1 podcast. We're coming to you live from the British Grand Prix here at the WTF1 Clubhouse. We've got quite a few people watching along, listening to our terrible opinions. Can I get a whoop? <laughs> Hope. There you go. And a, and a ha year as well. Perfect. <laughs> uh, of course, alongside me are actually alongside me. Tom Bellingham IRL. and Katie Fairman with microphones. I know it looks a bit weird probably for you guys watching, but that's so that everybody else can hear as well. Tommy, Katie, apart from sunburnt, how are you? Warm. That's really, that's usually what you say for final but thoughts. Yeah, but also brilliant because that was a lot of fun today. It's extremely hot here in Silverstone, but it's also really nice to be sat at a table recording a podcast with you in person. I could reach out and touch you if I really wanted to. Which I don't. But you don't. That's no. fine. <laughs> um, thanks so much for clarifying that, Katie. No worries. Um, <laughs> if you're wondering how to be uh, a member of Team WTF1, get involved in these sorts of amazing experiences, go to WTF1.com forward slash Team WTF1 for more information. So today we're talking all about sprint quali. On a Saturday, we had a race on a Saturday. Can you tell that I'm still processing that, that that's happened and we're not going home now? We've got another race tomorrow. Should we get in some three-word sprint reviews? I think we should. Uh, Tom underscore Verstappen 33 says, Magic Fernando Alonso. Is that That's not me, by the way. <laughs> that literally must be you. That has to be. That's amazing. Uh, bring back Quali. And Ross Heppard 14, or Ross Shepard, that might have been. Yeah, no, that definitely is Ross Shepard 14. Fun to watch. So I don't feel like those, those three really do justice to what I've seen on Twitter, Tommy, which is... Obviously, there's just chaos all, all the time on Twitter. On Twitter, no. No, there's, yeah. But I feel like maybe the fans are split with what happened today. A hundred percent. Every poll I've seen of, did you like that, was 50-50. But I feel like that's just Twitter anyway, isn't it? That everyone has a very strong opinion that they love it or a very strong opinion that they hate it. Nothing in between. No. <laughs> did, you, was, did it kind of match up to what you thought? Yes. Okay, perfect. Very and good. You, and you, Katie? Yeah, I was pleasantly surprised. I was quite pessimistic, and I still think that we need to have these other sprint qualities later on in the year. I don't think it's fair to properly judge it fully from one event. Um, but yeah, I was really quite impressed with the amount of action that we had in, in the race. Did you say better than expected? Was that your three words that you just said? Did you look at what my three-word race review is coming up? I did My three-word race <laughs> review, uh, for everyone watching, is better than expected. So let's start with mine. Um, it pretty much sums up exactly what I'm, I meant by that, is that it, I was pessimistic, pessimistic like you, and it kind of turned out to be pretty awesome. I know that lap one was a lot of carnage. You had, of course, Verstappen getting ahead of Hamilton, and you know there were, there were passes going on in the midfield, Mazepin spinning, you know, kind of everything you expect from a Formula One race. And... Um, yeah, I, I don't know if that maybe swayed my opinion a bit more positively than perhaps the rest of the race, but still, I thought it was better than I thought it would be. Yeah, it. I mean, I went in looking forward to it because I don't like practice, and it replaced practice. Um, and my view of it was that even if we got a pretty boring race and maybe not a lot happened, it's still more exciting than a practice session because you have the hype of the lights going out, you know, on the parade lab, everyone was so excited. L like, I think uh, even the people that had really dismissed it, as soon as the you had the parade lap and stuff, everyone was, you know, getting super hyped. And then F the start of an F1 race is one of the best bits about Formula One. It's just so good. And so to get that again, and it's replacing a practice session, it's like, well, yes. Yes, please. But the, f but then you know it did actually end up being quite a good race, even though they don't want to call it a race. But it is definitely a race. And I don't know why they're denying that it's a race when there's points awarded for the top three, and it was definitely 17 laps of racing action. But it's still qualifying. That's the weird thing: is that pole position in the record books goes to Max Verstappen, despite Lewis Hamilton getting the fastest lap time on Friday, which I don't agree with. I don't think many drivers do either. Like Vettel's come I out and said- I don't like that at all. No, it, I'm it doesn't make any sense. I'm happy to go off on a rant later about that, but. <laughs> That's, That's uh, the one thing I don't like as well is, uh, yeah. They could still have it. Why, why isn't the, um, why isn't Verstappen the sprint king? 
that they what they awarded in qualifying and Hamilton gets the pole because he's like for for the stats like Hamilton gets the pole because he was fastest in qualifying. It was very weird seeing a car cross the line and having Crofty go, and Max Verstappen is on pole position. It was like, what? You say, yeah. It just feels more like a red flag, doesn't it? You know, this we've just kind of had 17 laps that we wouldn't usually have. We're now got a red flag, and then everybody can choose whatever tire they want for tomorrow, which is which is crazy to see. At Levicious X comes in with a question: If the sprint proves to be a success by the end of the season, do you think it could be implemented as the permanent qualifying format? With new regulations next year, it could actually be a good idea to keep everything fresh. I don't want it to be permanent. I feel like it's a nice change to the to the guard, you know, the, the the layout that we're used to in Formula One, but. I'm not sure I'll be sold on it as a hardcore Formula One fan since I was very little to, to see this every single week. Because I'm still not sold. I think it was a good race today. Whether we need to change it permanently and for all of the races, I don't know. What do you think, Katie? I'm quite awkward with this, with this because I like change and I like the fact that Stefano Domenicali has come in as the president and CEO of Formula One and he's not afraid to shake things up. And big respect to him for that. But I also like the traditional side of things like you we've grown up watching formula one with practice followed by qualifying the order of qualifying start is the starting grid and that's just the way it is so i'm still kind of in the middle i'm sitting on the fence a little bit but um i don't want to see it as a permanent addition i think with the way that formula formula one has branded this you know we've seen loads of snazzy graphics and they've obviously put a lot of commercialization behind this it's now sponsored by crypto.com and i've got a feeling in my gut that this is going to be something which they're going to put a lot of energy and effort behind and we could see more of them maybe from next year like five spring qualies in a year or something rather than the three do you reckon it's maybe even, well, I mean, I say this like Formula One aren't trying to make money at all times. This is almost like a way in which they can get more sponsors involved in a, a different race that, you know, brings a completely uh, newer audience as well. Um, and we've seen that with the amount of fans that have been here this weekend, obviously, excluding the fact that this is the first British Grand Prix like since 2019 that fans have actually been able to attend. And it's been fantastic to see so many people packed in the grandstands and stuff. But yeah, like it's encouraged people to buy Friday tickets. I mean, for Tommy, I'm sure you could think of maybe not nothing worse, but like spending time coming to Silverstone and camping just to see some practice. At least this way, you'd be able <laughs> to see qualifying. Um, so I feel like it's drawn more people in for that reason. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously slate practice a lot, but when, when I'm at a track, I like going to, you know, it's, it's a great chance to see cars, so there's no denying that, but from from my perspective, it's always been that normally we start the session with three pretty dull, well, in my opinion anyway, like three sessions that essentially don't have much meaning, es especially from like a results perspective. Um, yes, they're setting up the cars and all that, but you get three sessions. Um, so it's not until Saturday, uh, afternoon where there's something where you you know properly hyped and something's really cool so with this format you get three meaningful exciting sessions uh, i don't uh, like i me liking this is not me saying i don't like qualifying we get we had a fantastic qualifying yesterday and we got to enjoy it and it was brilliant and we also had this and we also have a race tomorrow you're essentially having three really good bits of action every single day so there's no uh, i personally just can't see why this is not the best f format really you make a really good point about the fact that the first three sessions of a weekend especially when you go to a grand prix especially you know, when i was younger it friday was very much the boring day you know where you would you would see the most formula one cars and of course you know it's amazing to see them but in terms of meaningful sessions it wasn't till saturday where you could actually fully get your sort of claws into it so yeah i completely agree and uh, i just feel like that it, it, this will be the layout that formula one want to go towards because i mean we saw friday i mean we've obviously here at the british grand prix friday was jam-packed don't know how much of that is because obviously it's a test event and people are allowed to come along and you know, everyone's been cooped up but 
yeah, it felt good. It felt good to have something on Friday. And, you know, some people are saying it takes away the meaning of the race tomorrow. We'll see. I think that there is... There's no way they're not going to watch it, though, when people no. say that. It's like, no. as soon as the cars are on the parade lap tomorrow, you're going to be hyped again and forget about what happened today. People love to complain, don't they? Um, <laughs> that's the, the main thing of social media. Uh, next question. Uh, Luis Tiago 1409 says, do you think the sprint should be even shorter? At the end of the race, there, was, there wasn't that much going on anymore because the tyres were going and there weren't that many overtakes anymore. I mean, <laughs> there's not really much point sending them out if it's any shorter than that, in my opinion. I think 17 laps is good and it was gone in a flash. It probably was for people watching as well, but when you sat there in the grandstands, it was it was done in 17 laps. And you know, you're so used to seeing a 70 lap race, 60 lap race, that um, I think any shorter than that, and you're kind of taking away the entertainment and the potential jeopardy that you might have a little bit later on into the race, especially when you have the opportunity for Bottas to start on the softs. You know, if it's even shorter, we maybe won't have that strategy difference because everyone will just whack on the softs and, and go, you know, full pelt. Whereas we had that slight element of strategy, uh, which obviously didn't really do too much apart from Valtteri not being able to get anywhere near the front two, which was strange to say the least because we I thought he would be on the attack but in fact it was Verstappen that got past Hamilton so yeah I uh, I don't want it any shorter I think it got to sort of like lap 14 lap 15 and I thought um, this could probably do with like wrapping up here but then <laughs> just finish the race that's yeah, it, just, just just laps, okay. it off, throw the like flag yeah, yeah. Um, but then, you know, in future sprint qualifying, it could be that we have a really intense battle for that last championship point, like I thought we were going to get with Bottas or maybe Leclerc catching Bottas and, and taking that championship point. So I, for now, will say that, yeah, I think 17 laps is a good sort of ground to, to work from because if we start saying, oh, it should be shorter now, and then we could cut out potential, like, awesome racing action later on in the year, that would be a bit daft. Yeah, and you said you said it perfectly at the start as well that you can't judge it by just one race. Ev it's very easy to judge and say what's the perfect amount of time for uh, this sprint race because the race died down. But not every race pans out the same. You know, we might get a sprint race next for the next one, and nothing might happen. But that happens in normal races and. Equally, there might be a safety car and everyone is like, oh, I wish there was 10 more laps because this would have been amazing. So it, it, it's just, you just have to see it as like, this is how long the race is. And I totally agree with you as well that if it was any shorter, everyone just sticks the softs on and it's fine. Whereas you, you almost wanted it maybe a little bit longer because just as Max's and Lewis's tires, they're showing them blistering. You thought, oh, this could get a bit, you know, they could be in trouble here but in the end they were fine and it's crazy to see them go you know into the one minute 30s straight away you know not in a normal race 70 lap race of course full of fuel you'll see them sort of tooling around just you know building the tire temperature and things like that whereas this time they were just straight flat to the floor for for 17 laps which max said he really enjoyed which uh, was quite interesting but yeah i don't want to shorten it down and you know you might have a bit of rain in the air for one of our sprints uh, in the future. And can you imagine that? You know, the Haas probably not changing to wet tyres and just staying out on the dries and potentially winning. You don't know. So that would be uh, insane if that happens. Yeah, I mean we'll clip this. <laughs> yeah, clip it. It's going to happen. Uh, Lil underscore Ledfoot. There is a chance that the battles today have been taken away from the race tomorrow. Do you think amending the regulations with strategy rules like mandatory pit stops or same tyres for everyone in the sprint race could help with avoiding a potentially boring Grand Prix? It's a big question, that. It's a big question from Lil Ledfoot. There's a lot going on in there. Yeah, so do you think amending the regulations with strategy rules like mandatory pit stops or same tyres for everyone? <sighs> I, I like the fact that there's freedom with the tyres and things like that, that, as I mentioned, you know, with Bottas going on the softs, I was like, ooh, that's, that's a different uh, thing going on here, for especially for a sprint race. So for me, I don't think we need to change anything just yet with it. Let's just see how it runs for a few races and then we can start to tweak and maybe it needs to be a bit longer, maybe just another 70 lap race, you know, just get two in the weekend. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? I, I really liked the excitement at the start of um, kind of as the tyres came out the blanket, you didn't know and then everyone on Twitter was like, oh, Bottas is on the softs, do you know what I mean? So maybe they need to hype that more. But that's more, and I was saying this before we uh, we watched sprint qualifying to you guys, I think it was, that that's more just to do with the mandatory tyre rule as opposed to 
anything to do with the sprint quality format, right? Yeah, exactly. And you've been, been a big fan of getting rid of the tyres. Yeah, like, I, I yeah. don't get Not me getting wrong. Not the tyres, but <laughs> no well, tyres. <laughs> they, yeah, just, they just sit on the grid and do nothing. Um, yeah, with, with that, I, don't get me wrong, I was slightly concerned that everyone might pick the same tyres and I look really stupid, but actually what made the race was Alonso. Uh, why... Why could Alonso get from 11th to 5th, but Bottas could not challenge Hamilton and Verstappen at all? Like the those Fernando soft Alonso. tires. <laughs> yeah, he's Alonso. Um, so those those runners on the softs made it because it was exciting. Where the mediums is the kind of normal thing to do, and then the soft tire runners get further up the field and then drop back at the end. So that's what brings the jeopardy. Yeah, I think adding in things like pit stops, mandatory pit stops into a sprint race almost seems a little pointless because like you say, we were watching it and it seemed to be like over like that. And by adding in pit stops, it might add a little bit more drama, but I think it would take away from the whole purpose, which is that these guys are on track fighting for position to make the starting grid for tomorrow's race. Um, I mean, a reverse grid could have been fun, but at this point, I quite liked the concept that it was. I mean, like you say, we saw Fernando Alonso pull some insane moves, and you know, if he could have made that stuck and not been overtaken by the McLarens, like that would have been awesome. And I feel like um, switching it up too much might have taken away from potential storylines like that. Yeah, and I think Formula One don't want to go down the route of being Formula Two, where we sort of swap the top eight or whatever. Of course, Formula Two have now changed a three race format, which I'm not a fan of at all, to be honest. There's so many races, you don't really know which one to really take notice of. Of course, the final one tomorrow will you know, reward the most points, but there's so many races going on that it's, uh, it's quite hard to keep up with. We were thinking actually earlier that obviously F2 now reversed the top 10 rather than the top eight, but imagine if they did do reverse with the top eight, George Russell would have been on pole position. <laughs> and that's why they don't do it. Exactly. <laughs> Ready, ready to finish 11th <laughs> in, the exactly. in the actual yeah. race. Oh, Not get any points. Katie, should we go to your three-word race review? Sure. So my three-word race review is midfield makes moves. Alliteration. Um, I know. Nice. <laughs> um, and yeah, this is all about people like Fernando Alonso and the McLarens. Um, I just like the fact that this sprint quality allowed the people that normally might qualify in... I mean, I say that like Lando and people like that have done insane qualifying this year, but it was it allowed for a little bit of more of a shuffle that we wouldn't have necessarily got in normal qualifying. Um, and I think coming into this, I was skeptical and was like, nobody's going to bother any, like, do any ballsy overtakes or anything like that. It's going to be very safe. And uh, those guys proved me wrong. I think it was you, Tommy, saying yesterday in the quali watch along that these are racing drivers like they're not just going to tootle around in a going around in a circle like they're going to fight for position and they did do that and i found it very entertaining <laughs> yeah i'll kind of um uh, accept that i was on that same boat and yeah, uh, yeah. we sunk because uh, it was it was really good and the midfield clearly you know you look at it and you think actually yes the mclarens maybe weren't too happy with the performance maybe wanted to you know get into the top 5 top 4 whatever but um, they clearly made their moves at the start of the race and Danny Rick especially coming through as well after Fernando made that amazing start and yeah, they had to get through on Fernando. They couldn't just allow Fernando to be starting P5 because that would have affected their race quite a lot, especially with the fight to Leclerc. I mean, Charles Leclerc was just in a league of his own today, really. He was just chilling with Bottas, which, you know, kind of reminded us of when Lando Norris was on the pace of the Mercedes in Austria. Maybe not that quite that quick, but Leclerc looked, uh, looked very strong. And I think that fight between McLaren and Ferrari next uh, tomorrow, sorry, well, I say Ferrari signs. Uh, not not quite maybe for Carlos Sainz tomorrow, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's great to see the midfield just jostling for position, and it's it's kind of what I don't think we'll see that as much of that towards the front. Although Hamilton looked very eager on lap one, which was which was great to watch, but could he gone up the inside at Cops? I feel like he could have maybe taken that inside line, but didn't fancy it. Maybe maybe that was too much of a risk. I know they they were risking quite a lot, but maybe that was a step a step too far because for someone like Hamilton, he's like, well, I start second tomorrow, it is one point, and then, you know, it, you don't want to risk starting at the back like Sergio Perez. Um, yeah, we'll get on to him. We will get um, on to him. Uh, there's a question actually about Fernando. I should loop back to that from Flyer BH says, is Alonso the greatest starter 
in the history of Formula One? That's a big question because there's quite a lot of people that have been in F1. Yeah, yeah, and I'm sure there are some statistics out there. But, uh, I mean, I remember when he was back at Renault when he won the World Championship, that Renault was known as being an amazing starting machine and he always got great launches. But, you know, you're seeing it now as well that Fernando is part of that package and clearly a great starter. And to be fair, today, he just absolutely sent it. Like, he did not care if some, like, especially through turn one, he had the dirt flying up in his face and he was just sending it. Then he was around the outside. And then, of course, Perez went off and, and all of a sudden he's in P5. So I think Fernando just was like, you know what, I'm on soft tyres. I need to get in front of everybody. There was urgency there. Everyone else was maybe like, oh, no, it's sprint quality. You know, I can't, can't tap a, you know, a front wing or whatever. Whereas Fernando was like, you know what, I started in 11th at the moment. Let's go. Yeah, it's, uh, I'll give props to Katie, actually, because yesterday you said something along the lines of this is made for someone like Fernando Alonso, and it proved to be that way because he's one of those people, isn't he, that uh, he's, he's come back and he's probably not going to win another title, but he's come back and he just wants to enjoy himself. Watch and him win another four yeah, titles win another now. Title now but <laughs> yeah, you know, he's, he's won two world titles. He's done so much amazing stuff. And we, after a difficult start to the season, we're now seeing Fernando Alonso just doing Alonso things again, and that was just so so good. I mean, I was on was quite critical when they they hired him again. I thought, surely you know, he's had his time in F1. Renault should be promoting their young talent and stuff. But I've completely changed my opinion now because he's just brilliant to watch and. It does does feel like Fernando is one of those racers that's just there to ruffle the feathers and stuff of that that sprint format and just say, well, if you're being really cautious, I'm just going to drive around the outside of all of you. Then, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, obviously, going into this year, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of the bet that we made uh, with Fernando and Esteban. Please don't remind everyone. Don't please bring it up. Um, I said that Esteban Ocon would beat Fernando this year in the championship. To be fair, he started off strong, Esteban. He's just going through a rough patch, bless him. Fernando, I think, has like a metal jaw, doesn't he, or something? Uh, yeah, something like that. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I had a feeling that Alonso would ace this kind of event. I mean, clever me, didn't put it in my predictions for this weekend. But, um, I mean, just look at Baku from a few races ago after um, that two-lap sprint to the finish. And I think he went from, like, P10 to P6 or something like that. Um, and, yeah, he's proven throughout his F1 career that he's excellent at sort of the first lap overtakes and stuff like that. Um, and I was also quite um, optimistic about Kimi Raikkonen because he was also on the softs and he was way far back. I think he made up four positions um, in the first few laps of this. But yeah, yeah he's like another one. He was yeah. 17th and finished 13th. So he was exactly. the other big winner. And if you think back to Portimao last year and that incredible first lap that he had where I think he overtook like 10 cars or something like that, I have high hopes and uh, kind of similar to Alonso, to be honest. Like, maybe he just thinks, oh, well, I've been here long enough. Like, I know what I can do or like, I might just risk it because I was only starting in P17 anyway. And he could be one to watch um, in these other sprint quality events. Experience shining through then maybe for, for Kimi and Fernando. Uh, another question from Saiful Amran. Does today's sprint fully disprove the theory of no one would want to take risks? I don't think it fully disproves it because I still think that at the front it's not worth the risk. And, of course, we just spoke about Hamilton going up the inside at Cops. You know, that's probably too much of a risk, especially being behind Verstappen in the championship. In the midfield, it certainly has disproved the theory that they're not going to go for it because they're just mad and they just want to make up one, two positions because that is crucial for their fight in the midfield during the race. Of course, the, the front three will, you know, just go off into the distance. But, you know, P4, P5 potentially uh, on the cards, especially with Perez having that mistake, which uh, we should probably talk about right about now, do you reckon, Tommy? I mean, Sergio, it was a bit of an odd one, wasn't it? Through Maggots and Beckett's just lost the rear. And I was listening yeah. to a, an interview that he had and he seemed a bit, a little bit bewildered, just said he was a passenger and not ideal. No, uh, your, your prediction being Alonso would have a good sprint race. I thought Perez of all the drivers would be one of them that, you know, he's not been qualifying well, but the race is where he really comes alive. And with the, the fact that 
they're allowed a free chi tire choice. I really expected Perez to be one of the people that would go on the soft tire because he's the one that can make those tires last for he ages. He's like a tire god, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, exactly. So I was really surprised he he didn't try that. Um, but really surprised that he was the one that threw it away. And the sketchiest rejoin I have ever seen, I, I audibly like was shocked. We like yeah. gasped, didn't yeah. we? Everybody watching in Clubhouse. Yeah, exactly. It was just, oh my goodness me. It was, yeah, that could have been so, so bad the way he was like kind of losing control of the car on the uh, grass. And I think it was Sonoda came past at full speed. And when you when you see a car that's barely moving, it really puts into perspective just how fast Formula One cars really are. Because when you see the onboards, you don't tend to tell because you've got no like sense of speed. But yeah, that could have been really, really bad. But yeah, he's starting last tomorrow. He retired in the end, so yeah, he'll yeah. be at the back. I think we were surprised that he rejoined at all, to be honest, with the uh, camera angle of him flying off at, at Chapel and somehow managing to miss the wall. I was expecting a huge crash and uh, obviously continued on, then retired the car because, well, I mean, the team are allowed to retire the car if they think there's any sort of risk of damage and they can also change the setup if they then retire the car. So they can, you know, make Smart. a few tweaks and mm. uh, going into tomorrow, at least they can, you know, make Sergio's car, you know, from the learnings from today, you know, tweak a, a few things here and there to give him a chance to maybe get into the points at some uh, some time in the race. So, yeah, not ideal. And there's another bad rejoin we should probably mention, which was Carlos Sainz after his uh, little tangle with George Russell, uh, which, as of recording, is still being investigated, as far as I'm aware. Is that correct? Yeah? Yeah, good. Yeah, Both still nodding. Well, Excellent. I'm sure it's probably been solved now, but we don't know. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, uh, we'll just we'll, we'll find out after we've, we've done this. But um, yeah, so then the obviously there was that, that collision where George clearly just understeers into Carlos. I'd be very surprised if he doesn't get a penalty for that, to be honest. And then Carlos just came just kind of bouncing along the grass and then just came onto the track. And uh, I know that one car had to take avoiding action. I'm not sure who it was. It was one of the, the lower cars, maybe an Alfa Romeo or a, or a Haas. But yeah, it was very sketchy uh, from Carlos. And again, I wouldn't I would be very surprised if he doesn't get a penalty as well. Yeah, uh, again, just these drivers that a, a lot of people thought would be so cautious, w w it was uh, maybe not as crazy as normal starts, but th there certainly was, it wasn't any less crazy than a normal start. There, there definitely wasn't any kind of caution there. Um, w one thing I wanted to mention, actually, kind of going a little bit back to the, the person saying about the, the length of the, the sprint race, and with this question of does it prove that drivers don't want to take risks, I think what worked really well is that the drivers are hot-headed at the start, and when you're side-by-side side with another car, they don't get that chance to back off and an engineer tell them to slow down and save it. You don't get that bit in the race where maybe 30, 40 laps in, they're just like, right, save the car, settle down, get out of the dirty air, you don't get that. So I think that is what makes the sprint so good is that as it's just as it's about to simmer down, it ends. So you don't get that kind of dull bit, I guess. The next 50 laps, basically, is yes. what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, but that's a very good point, actually. You know, they're just basically surviving on their instincts at the start of the race. And then they also know that they don't have to really take into much account tire conservation. Of course, the Hamilton and Verstappen's w uh, tires were you know, blistering at the end, but that's because they were going pretty much maximum attack. So actually, speaking of tires, great segue. Tommy, your three-word race review, please. My three-word race review is tire gamble fun. Uh, kind of mentioned it a fair bit already, but for me, Alonso obviously was incredible, but not not only that, I'm so glad he did it and it worked because my concern is if it hadn't worked, people, people would say, oh, m maybe in the next race no one does gamble. But because Fernando Alonso has proved that you can actually kind of do that, everyone's then, you know, for the next sprint races, are going to go, well, we're in the midfield. Maybe it is worth doing something a little bit different because Alonso, yes, he dropped a little bit back at the end, but he started 11th and finished 7th, so it worked. Um, so 
it makes me excited for future sprint races and also for tomorrow to see what drivers will do a gamble again. Maybe, maybe, I mean, it's unlikely, but maybe Hamilton and Verstappen do something different. And then that would be an amazing race because they essentially have their two mini races separately and we see how it pans out in the end. So. Similar to what we have seen in the past with Formula Two races, if people watch Absolutely, that, where yeah. you know you have the you know the softer compound and then the harder compound, and it literally is a time trial between them. Which you know, in some ways, you want to see Verstappen and Hamilton battling on track, but we also are very you know in the know that these cars aren't particularly great to follow. So you know, and that's what sort of keeps that tension throughout the race is knowing that they're both fighting or you know Hamilton's done an extra pit stop and is trying to catch Verstappen even though they're not fighting on track there's that that constant looming sort of feeling of you know they're going to come together at some point so uh, yeah I agree I think it'd be great you know if you know Hamilton whips off his tires and he's on hards and then you know Verstappen's like you know I'm gonna go on the softs I, that's not gonna happen because the softs aren't a great race tire clearly from what we saw uh, in the first 17 laps of this sprint quality but going between the medium and the hard, then you might actually see a fight for the for the lead if Verstappen decides to go on, you know, a different uh, tyre strategy, as you say, slightly worse start, who knows? So, yeah, there's going to be some gambles out there for sure because, you know, you might have s further down the midfield, you might have some that go, you know what, I'm going to gamble on a safety car pretty early, whack on the softs, and then they'll be able to come in to change their strategy. So, it, it again, that's not really sprint quality, that's the, the Q2 tyre rule, but... Um, it's yeah, that's one thing that I think definitely would uh, would open up some some opportunities for action. I think so. I was intrigued to see how bad these mediums were blistering, especially for Hamilton and Verstappen. But uh, like the team bosses said, you know, it's just because they were pushing so hard um, that they started to blister like that. But yeah, I like. I like the jeopardy that we had at the start of not knowing, like you say, who's on what tyre. Um, and I think that's something that is severely missing just generally in like other qualifying and stuff like that in the race. So, yeah. Lovely stuff. Lots of discussion from the sprint quality. It's a lot of talking considering it's only been 17 laps of racing. I know. <laughs> we interrupt this WTF1 podcast for a very quick chat about our sponsor of this episode, ExpressVPN. Watching Netflix without using ExpressVPN is like paying for a gym membership but only being able to use the treadmill. You're pretty limited. ExpressVPN lets you change your online location so you can control where you want Netflix to think you're located. They have almost 100 different server locations so you can gain access to thousands of new shows. This works with many other streaming services too, BBC iPlayer, YouTube and more. A few examples of shows you'll be able to unlock is Inception on Canadian Netflix or Top Gear on UK Netflix or Jurassic World on Hong Kong Netflix. The list goes on. So why choose ExpressVPN over other VPNs? Well, they have blazing fast speeds. You can stream in HD with zero buffering. It's compatible with all your devices, phones, laptops, media consoles, smart TVs, and more. And it also encrypts your data. ExpressVPN has the added benefit of encrypting your data so you can browse the web securely. So be smart. Stop paying full price for streaming services and only getting access to a fraction of their content. Get your money's worth at expressvpn.com slash WTF1. So don't forget to use that expressvpn.com slash WTF1 to get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. Right, back to the podcast. Uh, but let's move on to a man that will be, I'm sure, happy, but also maybe a little bit disappointed because he finished a, a, a position lower than he would have started had it been actual qualifying which is George Russell, who, I mean, you had the meme ready to go. You actually sent the meme out about George Russell finishing in the top 10. I saw Tommy making this about halfway through. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he knew it was going to happen, but then you actually pressed post before he'd actually finished. Right. Yeah, I kind of forgot he hadn't crossed the line yet. So <laughs> thank goodness he didn't bin it on the, the final lap. The jinx didn't yeah. work this time. Thank goodness. Uh, so, of course, George Russell finished P9. You know, Perez going off. He, he still, George doesn't seem to quite have starts nailed. You know, you, you think in P8, maybe to be able to at least keep that position. But he seems to just drop down a few, uh, few positions, especially when he has such a great qualifying performance. So maybe there's something there. Maybe he's just a little bit nervous that, you know, he's in this great position, doesn't want to throw it away. You know, you're going to have the the likes of you know I um, Imola in the back of your head and and things where you've thrown away potential points finishes. So you say that, but in Sakir, that start to get past Bottas in turn one was pretty pretty good. But maybe that's because he was like, I haven't really got a massive grid. I mean, Im yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's only clean time road. Ever <laughs> is, so. I think to be fair to to Russell, you can't really 
criticize him for dropping back when he's taking the second worst car onto grid yeah, into Q3 the track. Um, when well, Latifi's there. Th there's the argument February. that it maybe isn't the second worst car, but I mean, when, when you're being matched up against Nicholas Latifi, who hasn't really gotten out of Q1... This is another thing. I, I do really wish George... You know, don't get me wrong, I think he's an incredible driver, and I would like to see him in a Mercedes, and I think he would do well, but it's... it's one thing that is really disappointing is his two teammates have been Kubica, Kubica, not the old amazing Robert Kubica, and Nicholas Latifi. So, yeah, it is really hard to gauge just how bad the Williams is. You know, the, there's no denying it's not a good car, but would uh, Lando, Norris, or maybe a, a, a an F2 driver like, you know, someone someone that's looking good. Jack Aitken. Yeah, like someone else that's like a, a young F2 driver, you know, ready to sort of give him a bit of a challenge. Might be, you know, might do a bit better, but it's just a shame that there's no real benchmark there for, for George. We'll get it eventually. Uh, I'm sure he'll get some sort of drive uh, Lewis in Hamilton. the future. <laughs> well, fingers crossed. That would be amazing. Um, a question from... Wesley Poo 0142. Somebody's just spat out his good drink. Good time to start <laughs> drinking. Uh, can we do a 10 to 1 point system for the top 10? A, to make every spot mean a little more, and B, so Russell could get his point. Not a fanboy, just passionate, he said. So um, I don't think 10 to 1. I think I think I mentioned to you guys maybe the, the old points format where it's like 10, 6, 4, 3, 2, 1, or maybe 8, 6, 4, 3, 2, 1, something like that where the winner gets a bit more... I understand that Formula One don't want to put too much emphasis on sprint quality giving too many points, but at the same time, I would like to see maybe the top five rewarded, top six maybe, where those midfield battles, which, you know, I mean, fair enough, they're battling anyway. You know, we they don't need any more, um, you know, reward than to, to get higher up the grid. But I would like to see maybe the top five uh, get points and then maybe a little bit more for the winner as well so that we get to see Hamilton and Verstappen maybe going a bit a bit harder than, than we might see with only 3 to one I mean, that's literally just the fastest lap if one of them finishes first and the other one finishes, uh, finishes second. So that's my thoughts. I am also in agreement with, I think, top five should get points. Um, I think top ten is a little bit insulting to the normal, like, 300 kilometres that the guys drive is on the front. insulting? It's insulting. Um, but, yeah, like, they race for an hour, 45 minutes, and there's so much that goes into those races and strategies and all sorts and trying to avoid trouble that if you're going to award similar points to a sprint race, which is only 17 laps and literally, like, foot to the floor, off you go, um, I think that would be a silly thing to do. But, yeah, I like the idea of top five points. I think that could be good yeah yeah i agree if you if you're doing 10 to 1 you're not you'd have to change the normal point system to be higher because it doesn't make sense to give 10 out for a very very short race have you swallowed a voice changer you sound so deep now <laughs> hello <laughs> amazing yeah. um right next up we're not actually going to do A, B, C, D, F, 1, uh, as it's too short to really rate. And we don't want to take that away from the actual podcast we'll do tomorrow, where we still won't know where the Alfa Romeos or the Hasses were no. during the race. But the rest of them uh, we will on rate tomorrow. On A, B, C, D, F, 1, if you do vote on the website, check the website as soon as the race finishes, because we're going to be recording our reaction podcast on a Sunday rather than a Monday. Um, so, yes, if you do vote... Please vote soon so we can include your voting in our podcast. Indeed. That and then really we can smooth. all disagree. Oh, you look, do you want to take over? No. Honestly, it's great. <laughs> really no. <laughs> uh, so let's, we're going to do, uh, what was it that you called it? Stars of the Sprint? Well, Is that I, what you I wrote that in the sheet game? and I didn't even realise until I read it back that it does sound like something F1 would probably call it. Let's, yeah, do like it. let's do it. Let's go like get it. Speed King Award, Speed or whatever they the called the, the thing. The Heineken Star of the Sprint, or something <laughs> like weird like that. But yeah, this podcast is not sponsored by Heineken. Mm -hmm. Carry on. Yeah, but yeah, star, star, I just put Star of the Sprint. Okay, Star of the Sprint. We'll star. go with that. Star, Star of the Sprint. So we're going for one star. Oh. Is that correct or stars? We can go stars? one star. I think it'd be I very easy. <laughs> I think Heineken should sponsor it because their logo is a little star, isn't it? They'd this be literally stupid not to. But anyway. <laughs> That was the joke. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right over. <laughs> and moving on. So, my, s well, I, I mean, 
obviously, Fernando Alonso's in that equation. Should we just be a collective sort of discussion rather than my star of the sprint was? <laughs> yeah. Or well, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, Fernando, I think Danny Rick was actually particularly impressive, not because he was star of the sprint as such, because Lando still beat him, but it was much better from Danny Rick. And, you know, he was, g he was great in quality. You know, he was with Lando. And, you know, once he finally got past Alonso, he was kind of matching Lando's pace as well. So it looks good for tomorrow for Danny Rick. If he manages to jump Lando at the start, then he may well be the first McLaren to finish. So Danny Rick at least caught my attention. Charles Leclerc was also great for pace, but in terms of, I, d I mean, I don't know what the actual terms and conditions are, Tommy, for what a star of the sprint is, but it has to be Fernando me, because, I mean, he was acting like everybody else was a ghost car and he just kind of just sent it and, and managed to hold on. So, yeah, Fernando. I, I, yeah, 100% Alonso, it's got to be. Anyone else that took, you, took your fancy? Um, oh, Kimi was a big winner because... He was not great in qualifying and did did well, but just Alonso is just the star of that that whole race, and everyone just saw the old Alonso again. Which Do we have like I a really cheesy award as well to give him? That that'd be quite yeah. good. Yeah, no, be cool. uh, we don't have budget for that. <laughs> Katie, uh, yeah, I think if you don't say Fernando Alonso, then um, you're very silly. <laughs> very silly. I had to Perfect. be careful. I don't want to insult everyone that didn't think the same. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's just Katie's way of saying more rude things. Right, so um, that's pretty much it. That's the end of the document. We've never done one of these uh, Saturday sprint podcasts. So, Tommy, final thoughts? I'm so glad it, the sun is setting because I've been so warm today. My glasses have fallen down about 40 times because of the amount of sun cream that's on my face, so it's just like a slide. Uh, Katie? Katie? My final thought is just thank you to everybody who you can't see behind the camera. I'm sure um, they'll get a shot. They'll get yeah, a shot. Don't thank you, you all so much for sticking around and listening. You guys are awesome. I don't know what that little wave was. I was like I was on the driver parade or something. <laughs> wow, my final thoughts was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you like, I wish clap. the sun would go away. And I just went, I hate the sun. <laughs> uh, and I just want to say again, thank you to everybody that's here and also everybody watching that isn't at the campsite because there's we've been inundated with people coming up to us, speaking to us, whether they're uh, coming to Silverstone for the first time, whether they're massive veterans of the sport and they're always here. It's been awesome to do meetups. Uh, we're going to be doing another one tomorrow if you're coming to Silverstone in the fan zone. Um, this is going out tonight, so that will be relevant by the time this hits YouTube. So uh, that's very exciting. Uh, times and details will be on our social media once Tommy makes the graphic, which uh, is not made yet. No, okay. nope, cool, cool, cool. Cool. Uh, but yeah, it's been an amazing experience and um, I'd like if the podcast could end in lots of people cheering because that's amazing. So thank you to everybody. Yeah! Woo thank you. Very good. <laughs> that is the worst outro ever. <laughs> no. Do we wave now? We usually wave to oh each no. other, oh don't sorry, we? Sorry, yeah. Bye. 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 See ya. Where's Frank? Let me just get my <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. How do I hang up? <laughs>